Welcome to Choose the Nickel. I'm your host, George Bailey. My co-founder and technical support is the gorgeous Christina Bailey. This podcast is about giving kids financial freedom. We're interviewing fascinating people for their insights about how children learn to be financially savvy. Our guests come from diverse, sometimes conflicting schools of thought, and we love the opportunity to learn from them. We encourage all to weigh our guests' ideas on how to help children thrive, both financially and in general. We invite you to visit our website at www.choosethenickel.com, subscribe to our newsletter, and try out the things we are learning on the podcast. Our next episode features Allison Bischoff, co-founder and president of Rozzy Learning Company. Allison has worn many hats throughout her career. She has been a researcher in a neuroscience lab and managed multi-million dollar projects. She was also a senior curriculum writer at an education technology company. In addition, she was the program director for a creative writing program at a domestic violence shelter. Allison hopes to encourage all kids to confidently pursue careers through engaging, fun programs. Allison and her company are doing amazing things to help children become educated in the STEM subjects, and they are adding financial literacy to their product. Ladies and gentlemen, Allison Bischoff. Thank you for being on, Allison. Thank you. So tell me a little bit about Razi and its founding. What kind of an organization are we talking about here? Razi Learning Company was born out of Jessica being a preschool teacher after college and finding that STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math was a really important subject that teachers were talking about, people in industry were talking about, but there was nothing for really young kids. So she believed, and we believe that kids as young as two and three years old should and can be exposed to learning about STEM and learning about careers related to STEM. The earlier you introduce kids to any type of topic, careers or otherwise, the more likely they are to be interested in it and pursue it later on. So we started um, with a children's book. We wrote a book called Maggie, the Magnifying Glass that introduced STEM topics to kids. And Ah, so, so that's where your logo comes from. Is that right? Yes. So the magnifying glass has become emblematic of Razi. It inspires thinking and inquiry. So um, from the book, we ended up creating curriculum. And so now we work with over 500 schools across the country that use our STEM curriculum. And we've expanded from preschool all the way up to eighth grade now. That's an amazing amount of progress to be made. And how many years is that again? So we've been selling for about two, two years. As you've gone about talking with teachers about this and getting them excited, how easy is that sell? Some teachers and administrators are really excited for STEM. They know they need it, but most STEM programs are extraordinarily expensive, like tens of thousands of dollars. So with our program called STEM Career Adventures, we created an affordable model so that any type of school, small, large, public, private, can use it. Then there are always schools who are a little more hesitant to bring on STEM because The teachers themselves feel like they weren't good at STEM, and so they're a little afraid to teach it, or they're not sure how it can fit into their model because a lot of schools still use textbook learning and worksheets. And so we work with schools a lot on how to implement this if they are a little hesitant or unsure. But most teachers are really open to it. Teachers like having something new. And honestly, it's really fun and exciting. They're doing really fun projects. So it gives the teacher a break from having to stand up at the classroom. That's wonderful. And you are in how many states? I think we're in over 40 now and in Canada. Last time we talked, you said it was about 37. So you guys are just, yes. I signed on New Mexico and Montana. So some um, smaller population states. Schools all across the country understand that career learning and STEM learning is so important for their young kids. Who are the holdouts? Alaska, we don't have yet. And I think we do have a Hawaii, amazingly. But honestly, we find that states that just don't have a lot of money towards education. Unfortunately, in Missouri, we're one of them. I hate to say that not we don't have as many clients in our home state right now as we would like. Most of our clients are on the coast. But then we have 
15 schools in Oklahoma. So it's really a mixed bag. We're about 50-50 private public, which is also wonderful to see that lots of types of children in different areas. We have kids in rural areas, kids in cities using it. And so it's really a topic that crosses all of those boundaries. I noticed that your team at Razi consists of all women. How does that affect the dynamic of your business? I think that was something that wasn't done intentionally. We work with a lot of men in terms of our mentors and our friends of ours who we have, but we really made it a point to seek out teachers to come on and help create more of our products. So it started off just Jessica and I, but as we're expanding our product lines, we wanted to have real teachers, real curriculum writers who are in the field to create our program. In our country, most teachers are women. So we have ended up with a team of all women, which in terms of dynamic, it's really wonderful because we have single moms, we have stay-at-home moms who are looking for part-time work. So we take a lot of pride in being able to give women a way to have a job and a way to have a lot of self-efficacy without having to compromise leaving their kids or taking a job they don't want to take because almost all of our teams is remote besides Jessica and I and our assistant who works with us part time. So we feel, you know, really like we're really empowering these women who have had to leave the teaching field to have kids and now they can get back into it in a new way. It looks like you have a marvelous group answering a very meaningful call. I like what you guys are doing. Rozzy first got my attention when I was reading an article in the St. Louis Business Journal about an award that you and your group had won. It said in that article that Rozzy was developing a financial literacy curriculum. And that right there, that was like, it became very evident. I got to talk with these people. It sounds like you're doing something really exciting there. What can you tell me about this curriculum? We still want to maintain a career focus, but there are so many jobs out there that are related to finance and economics. And oftentimes, kids can be very hesitant to go in and self-conscious because they feel like they're not good at math or they don't understand something. So the financial literacy curriculum that we're going to be writing is a way to give kids the basics and teach them about careers and that there's lots of types of careers that are related to finance and money. So it doesn't mean you just have to go be an accountant or be a financial planner. There's lots of different types of people who work with money. And even entrepreneurs will be one of our careers that you have to learn how to work with money. Or someone who works at a grocery store also has to understand money. Giving kids a way to relate to these harder topics like math and currency and whatever it is, is something that we really want want to do. And we're really hoping to partner with organizations who work in the financial sector. We actually just had a meeting today with a woman who works for a large financial business and they could help sponsor the program. And in St. Louis, we have several firms um, here. And so we really want this to be at a community level effort. That's wonderful. And I think that it it supports your underlying drive. Like when I look at STEM careers, what we're essentially saying is we want you, we want to prepare you to learn about something that's going to be very useful in society, that society is going to reward greatly. But if you receive that reward and you don't have the underlying understanding of how money works, you know, I've seen plenty of people who get into these fields and yet it's one thing to make a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars a year. It's another thing to know how to manage that money well. So that way you're fortifying the value of your product to begin with. Exactly. This is really all about building foundations. And that's what we say, like you can teach preschoolers this. And people always say, how can you teach preschoolers this? And we don't have them sitting at a cubicle doing this job. It's all about exposure to them. And I think the first time we talked, I had said that Jessica and I came from very well off families. My dad was a stockbroker and I know nothing about stocks or trading. I didn't use checks or I don't think 
think I've ever balanced a checkbook in my life. And so these are all the topics and skills that even though I don't need to know how to balance a checkbook day to day, by understanding that, it helps inform me in other areas of my life. Absolutely. So really taking the kids back to basics and doing it in a way that's relatable too. I think kids tend to get bored. Teachers don't know new ways to teach about these things. They've been teaching the same way of how to balance a checkbook for 30 years. And so that's why we brought on such an innovative team of writers who can really come up with fun, engaging ways for the kids to learn these dry topics. You know, you may be on to something, though, with kids working in cubicles. Like, I always thought the kids look most adorable when they're in their shirt and tie get up and whatnot and might give – it could give new <laughs> meaning to, to child labor or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think we – I don't think we'll we'll go there, though. I'm not, I'm not a fan of that. But that's really great. I like what you're doing. Beyond writing a checkbook, what are some of the other skills within financial literacy that you feel are critical for children before they graduate? One of the biggest topics is learning how to save money, learning how to create different pots of money that you have. Here's money I'm going to spend. Here's money I'm going to put away forever until I'm 60 and want to retire. Here is saving for monthly bills and here's saving for bigger purchases. And it's really important for kids to learn because when I left college, I didn't have any of my own money. I had never worked before I left college. And so learning that you really have to methodically think through things and really plan out these things. And it's intimidating as a 22 year old being like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't learn these things. If you learn them from the age of five and six years old, it becomes second nature. So especially in this climate of student debt, which probably isn't going to go away, kids really need to learn how to save money, how to put it into different areas of their life so that they don't feel like they're not spending anything or spending it all. Also learning about things like credit cards and credit card interest and what that means. I think a lot of people when they leave college or leave high school don't understand if they just put everything on a credit card, the consequences of that. So learning about how like that system works and then also learning about things like stocks and the the stock market and what that means. I think that's another area that is so intimidating to people that they don't even try it or understand it. So giving kids ways to understand what that is so that when they go out into the real world, they can understand where their 401k is or what it means to put away money in different types of stocks. On a different topic, where did you grow up? I grew up in Florida, in Tampa, Florida, and then Jessica grew up in Arizona, and we met in the middle at Washington University in St. Louis. I, like, I could hear your voice. You're like, wow. You wanted to say wash you, didn't you? I didn't say why. It's it's funny because it's a great school. I mean, it is really one of the best schools in the country. And yet, if we just said Wash U, that's so local, and, and people would just be like, "Where is that?" But you know, you want people to to look this up. It's a terrific school. I went there. You went there. It's a, uh, that's awesome. Florida. Okay, so Tampa. Remind me. I'm ashamed to say this, but I'm thinking right now. Okay, is that in the middle of the state, or is that that's right by Orlando um, gotcha. on the west coast? Okay, uh, yeah. So right on the west. You get out to the beach often as a kid? All the time, even though I'm very pale, so I was lathered in sunscreen. I had to be very careful. But yes, a lot of outdoors. And I actually went to like a semi-outdoor school. I came from a very progressive school, which I think has also informed how we do things in the company as well. Now, when you say progressive school, you, you mean it in terms of just they're trying new things. They're going, let's get the kids outside. I assume that, that you probably did a little bit of gardening or why outside? Exactly. Why was that so important? So I think it's important to put kids in different environments so that they can learn to adapt. So when we were learning about water quality, we weren't doing it in a lab. We were out on a canoe in the lake behind the school and actually taking samples. And we had peacocks. It was on a peacock farm. So there were peacocks everywhere. You ever get, um, atta- I think- you ever get attacked by a peacock? Yeah, well, sometimes they would get in the building. <laughs> and that was a little hot mess. 
But I think when you put kids in different environments, it stimulates their brain. It forces them to adapt to different places. Kids are so adaptable at this age. They're not rigid like us adults at all. See that? Um, so it was great to that be would, in that environment. <laughs> that would traumatize me. I could just imagine your teacher like, kids, run! <laughs> I mean, literally, they were just, everywhere. They were just, and like the parents were always dodging, trying not to hit them. I mean, they were crossing the road. It was, it was a lot. Um, but it was, it was really, really fun. Um, except when you always stepped in peacock poop. That was, that happened like on a weekly basis. Um, so new shoes all the time. It was a really fun environment. And so that's something we encourage our teachers to do now. Our program can be done almost exclusively outside if you want to. So we have a lot of outdoor schools and schools who prioritize outdoor learning using our program. And so that's really great to see. Oh, wow. So I could see a lot of the influence there in your style and whatnot. Outside of this school, where do you fall in the order in your family? Are you youngest child, a middle child, oldest child? I'm an only child. An only child. Okay. Do you have any memories of your mom and dad taking the time to really explain life out to you? Like, this is how it works. Yes. So I was really lucky. I had a stay-at-home mom. My dad was a stockbroker, so he was home right after the closing bell at four o'clock. And so I was really lucky. Like I had a lot of parent support. Most kids don't have that. Most kids have parents that work. Both their parents are working. They have single parents. They have lots of siblings, and so you can't just focus on one kid. So the onus falls a lot on teachers. So that's why we try to give teachers a lot of materials and resources. Something we also want to expand to is giving parents resources. So we are coming out with a line of products that are printable magazines and books. And that's something that's perfect for at home because a parent could print it out or the teacher can print it out and send it home in the backpack. Kids that have a lot of parent support do tend to do better overall um, just because they have more resources. Do you remember specific instances of that parental support playing a very formative role in the way that you developed later on? I think the biggest thing I got from my parents was they were always big on trying things again and like never giving up. So when you have someone there, and it doesn't even have to be a parent, it can be a sibling or just another mentor in your life that's encouraging you that just because you weren't good at something or you failed at something that you can continue to figure it out. My parents were always big on let's figure it out. Let's not just say, oh, I didn't get it right, move on. It was always like, how can we work through this? And what's great about STEM, whether it's financial literacy or the other topics, is there's not always a right answer to something. It's a lot of problem solving. It's a lot of coming up with the best solution, not necessarily the right one. And so when you have that mentality of trial and error, then kids don't get as frustrated because you know that you can eventually come to an answer. You bring up a very interesting point with this idea of needing a mentor to be there with you to explain things through to help you to become a more critical thinker. Mm -hmm. Did you have a mentor among your elementary or middle or high school days outside of your parents? I really didn't. I did have teachers that I was really close to. So it was either teachers or my parents. I didn't really have any outside forces, but I also had a very small nuclear family. We didn't live near my aunts and uncles. My family was on the West Coast and up on the East Coast. So being down in Florida, it was just my parents and I and then whoever we surrounded ourselves with. But I know so many people who when they have like a bigger family, they seek out mentors in other areas of their life. So whether that's a coach or another family member or a friend's family member. And so I think those are all like great ways to find and build your own support team. And with your parents, were you a pretty difficult child to raise, a fun child to raise? What's your assessment? I think I was pretty easy. Like I never broke a bone. Ah. I never got in trouble. I But I wasn't like goody two shoes. I was really sporty. I played a lot of sports. I really liked school. So I think that made it easy for my parents. I know parents who have kids who hate school. It's like a constant battle. I really enjoyed school. So I think that really helped with my parents. And they always joked that they couldn't have more kids because I just came out perfect. So they uh, they didn't want to <laughs> test the water. So and potentially get a bad egg. 
But yeah, I think kids often are difficult because they're bored or they don't know what to do or they don't have someone who's telling them what to do in life. And so I was really lucky. I was in clubs after school. I played a sport after school every day, every season. And those are all things, even they don't have to be academic, just things that, you know, enrich your life as a kid. What sports were you most into? I played volleyball, basketball, and tennis for like my whole childhood. And then I did rowing in high school. Awesome. Okay. So I know a few rowers. Uh, I've done it myself. I was horrible at it because I couldn't keep the boat straight. Plus my upper... Yeah. (laughs) So so I I would think it would be really intense. Like the upper body strength that it requires is substantial. I was a gangly kid. How did you persevere? I mean, I was rowing like after a couple of times, I was like, okay, I got my merit badge. I'm out of here. How right. about you? What, what what was it that kept you doing that? I think with rowing, people like to joke it's like a cult. You get really <laughs> close because you travel a lot to regattas, and so you yeah. have to like travel to a river. So you're you're with your team a lot. It's a very team oriented sport. So I think having your teammates around you, and I'm also a competitive person, mm. so I just don't easily give up on things and I want to be the best at them. Really, it's just so fun to have people around you. And my mom was really into it too. So she was really pushing me to do it as well. Yeah, it's a real community effort. Anytime as a child that you remember learning something very important about the world of business. I remember having a very hard time learning percentages and fractions. And that was hard because my dad was trying to like put it in the context of money and stocks even and things like that and earning certain percentages. And that was something that was really hard. And that's when I learned I was really a visual learner. Even in business, I'm that way now. My dad and my fiance are two people that you can give them a really complicated math problem and they can do it in their head. And they can convert percentages and decimals and fractions. And I've never been that way. And my mom was more of a visual learner. And so she would like draw it out for me. And we would talk about fractions and percentages. Even in business, I'm that way now. I had to do a profit and loss statement for the first time when I started this business. And so being able to see everything out and like what goes into your expenses, what goes into your revenue and your margins. I can't hold those things in my head. And I think in in America and probably around the world, we tell people who can do things really quickly that they're the best at things. And that, oh, like you should go into finance or you should be a doctor. And that people who need to take a little more time need to just do other things. <laughs> I am one of those people, by the way. Yeah, and if you feel self-conscious about it. Like, oh, I, I need I need to like write out what 12 times 12 is sometimes because I can't just think it off the top of my head. So I've learned even in business, you can slow things down. You don't have to go at the pace that everyone else thinks you need to be going at. <laughs> oh, and it's wise too as well, because when you make a mistake there, it, it can be really devastating. You know, I agree exactly. with you. And, you know, and it's funny because I like that you were a visual learner. Do you think that that influenced the way that you and Jessica designed Razi? Yes. So I think Jessica and I are very similar in that way. We're very hands-on, tactile, visual people. And so that's our whole program. Our program is not worksheets. It's not a teacher standing up at the board reading things to you. The kids are doing things with their hands. There's so much research. There's nothing out there really debunking this, that hands-on learning is the best way to learn. That's why still writing is better than typing. There is a lot of research out there that if you want to learn for like a test in college, it's better to write out your notes than to type them out. Because the more you work with your hands, it's creating memories and muscle memories in your mind. And so our whole program is hands-on learning. That's awesome. At any time as a child, did it ever hit you that you were going to be an entrepreneur? Oh, absolutely not. I wanted to be a professor. I wanted to be in research and be a psychologist. That's what I wanted to do my whole life, and that's what I started at. Jessica was actually the same way. We were both in graduate programs before we started Razi. But when I asked my mom if she thought I would be doing something like this, she said she's not surprised that I am the boss of something. She thought I would always be the boss. 
being an only child and all. And Jessica is the oldest of three. So she also has that boss mentality. But in the 90s and early 2000s, I don't think the word entrepreneur really existed in pop culture and in academics. Nobody was really talking about it. Obviously, people were entrepreneurs, but it wasn't the buzzword in the field that we have today. And even at, at Wash U, there is a whole entrepreneurship center now. That didn't exist when we were in school eight years ago. We you know, never saw ourselves owning a business or being an entrepreneur or anything like that. Well, it's kind of like it's the new hip thing to do. You know, and I exactly. hope it never becomes too cliche. I hope that we have an appreciation for the sacrifice uh, you know, that it requires and the hard work. Now, you mentioned earlier that your products are not limited to just schools. And that parents outside of school can access what you guys do. This interests me a lot because my wife, for one year at least, she home taught my son, has thought about home teaching a couple of our other children, you know, homeschooling. I'm saying home teaching, my bad. What are some of the, your favorite resources for the teacher of the individual student? I think a lot of parents really rely on things like Pinterest. And teachers pay teachers, which are all like great options where you can find lesson plans and activities to do kind of a la carte. And then there are obviously programs out there that are specifically for homeschool families. We're always of the mindset that going with a company where you know it's more evidence-based, it's researched, that it's quality is the best way to do it. So using things that are tested or at least referred from. But there are so many resources out there, free and not free for parents. But it's so disparate. Like you don't know where they are and you don't know what's good and what's not. So right now we focus on teachers, but eventually we do want to have a focus on parents. And we want to be able to say to parents, like, come to us for all things career related and come to us for STEM or for financial literacy, because there's so many options out there. You don't know what's good and what's not. I do appreciate that you are evidence driven. It sounds like you're keeping up with your research and I, I respect that. We can grasp what it is that it's effective and what's not. And it may sure. be very complicated at times. And sometimes the statistics, you know, and the evidence support one conclusion or another. And then of course you've got the multitude of children personalities. And that's going to be really interesting along with everything else. But I like that you guys are doing that. Do you have any final words of advice for parents who would like to raise financially savvy children? The first place you can start is at home and talking with your kids about money. I think in our country, People feel like they shouldn't talk about money, like they shouldn't talk about salaries or they shouldn't talk about how much things cost. And so I think when you go to the grocery store with your kid, you can say like, this is our budget for this trip. And now we're going to talk about like what we can spend on that and just in making it something that's a part of their thinking and making it something that's not scary or a secret I think adults tend to do that and not even realize they're doing it or they think they're protecting kids by doing it. But I think you just really have to be open with your kids about things and talk about money. Um, and you can start at home. There are obviously lots of resources out there. You can Google ways to do it. But I think starting at home is the best place to do it because there's so many teaching moments at home, whether it's paying for something, it's going to the grocery store, the movies, buying them supplies for school, whatever it is. There's lots of moments that you can take and turn into a, a teaching moment. Re replacing that broken piece of equipment that they just broke. What is that going to require? Yeah, exactly. I agree. I don't I think I think that's very interesting because when we look at money, we need to realize that there is a real world application in the home, directly right. in the home for almost everything we do. Otherwise, what is it for? Most everything we buy has some bearing on how we live our lives. And so, exactly. you know, I think that you can find a lot of great examples. You just have to have a creative mind, open your eyes, take a look around the room and think, ah, this is where money ties into the home. There are opportunities. I appreciate that. Exactly. Yeah. And just even like so many kids want to buy something. And so I think like a good place to start is if your kid says, oh, I want this new toy. 
then you say, okay, like we're going to have to figure out how much it is, how much money every week you need to save to reach that goal. And so they just little moments like that where not just saying, okay, we'll buy that for you. Um, you know, it, it's yeah. a little more work on the parents part, but that's like a great opportunity just in that one instance. <laughs> great. What is your favorite charity? I mean, I'm a sucker for dogs. I'm always about stray rescue and the humane society. <laughs> Nice. Nice. But that's another great way to teach kids doing okay. like charity too. Yeah. It, well, so, t- but tell me about that. Tell me about the dogs. Are you involved in any of these organizations? I'm not involved. I try like whenever I can. I'm one of those people that if I actually go there, I'll want to take all the dogs with me. So I tend to just donate money or do things like that, like go to events that are sponsored. So they're getting the money. I can't go see the dogs because I will take them all home with me. But there's a lot of great like St. Louis based organizations like Treats Unleashed. That is a series of dog stores. They donate a lot of their proceeds to Stray Rescue here in St. Louis and the Humane Society. Society, so I always try to support and buy things from those places that do that. Where do you think your love of that cause started? I grew up with dogs. I had seven dogs as a kid, and now I have my own dog. And I just, because I was an only child, they were my siblings. They were, you know, just such a part of our family. And I had parents who were very attached to their dogs. They had two dogs before I was even born, and I was raised with them. So I've always just had an affinity for dogs. Did they ever protect you from the peacocks? Yes, they were very protective. One was an Akita and one was an Alaskan Malamute. They were very protective dogs um, and they were kind of scary looking. So people would see like a baby <laughs> and be like, oh my God, they're going to eat that baby. And they were really going to eat the person who came near me. And now I have a golden doodle who is like the opposite of terrifying in every way. I, I was going to say an Akita. I mean, those, those are some pretty uh, dangerous looking dogs. Yeah, yes, I've seen those. They're, That's they're very scary um, looking, but they're, and they're so intelligent that that's what's scary is they're they're so they can outsmart a human in a split second but now i have a big fluff ball of a dog who you know thinks he's scary but is not at all (laughs) (laughs) what is your your favorite kind of dog Oh, gosh. I I really love big dogs. But now that I have a golden doodle, it's hard to go back. Golden doodles are really smart and they're really fun and playful because they have a poodle and a golden retriever. So I kind of have been a doodle convert now, but I still love my big dogs as well. I love all dogs. I really could take any dog. (laughs) Oh, I'm sure you could. I'm I'm not going to dispute that at all. I, 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 But I'm also very curious, like, now there's got to be some golden doodle pressure right now because you've got a golden doodle and I can imagine that you you think like if I say anything other than a golden doodle my dog's going to hear and my dog's going to be upset. No, no, no. Okay, don't give in to that. I need to know outside of the golden doodle. Okay, let's stipulate that the golden okay. doodle is the most amazing dog on the face of the planet. Sure. What is the second most amazing dog? I really like Alaskan Malamute because that was one of my first dogs too. So Alaskan Malamutes are up there as well. Got it. I, I hope that that took some pressure off you allowed for an honest answer without yes, like, you know, you don't want to diss on the doodle. Okay. So, you know, like you gotta, the doodle, yeah, the doodles, they've got it going on. Okay. So the golden doodle, is it a boy or a girl? It's a boy and he's a mini. So he's a mini oh, golden. So that's, he's like, that's awesome. He's like three pounds. And how old is he? And what's his name? He's two and a half and his name is Augustus and we call him Augie. Favorite hobby. Mine or his? His. <laughs> oh, playing um, with the tennis ball. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, uh, Allison, it has been a real pleasure to have you on the show. I thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Everybody else, thank you for listening. We hoped you enjoyed the interview and found useful ideas about things you can do with your kids. Be sure to check the show notes at www.choosethenickel.com for links to names, books, and other resources we discussed in today's show. Also, please subscribe to our newsletter and visit our contact page where you can give us feedback. We invite you to share Choose the Nickel with your friends and join us in our quest to give kids financial freedom.